We break in the new year with a $1 million hack, which could have been $2.5 million. And I wanna go through this hack because although we didn't learn too much, we can learn a bunch from what went down, how they fixed it, how they didn't fix it, and just to reiterate a couple of things we should never do on our smart contracts. So if you haven't seen this yet, we scroll down to this article. Big thank you to the people who went through this and actually helped out. This was one of these attacks that the SEAL 911 team actually helped out with, and they ended up recovering almost $1.5 million. SEAL 911 is a phenomenal team that everybody should donate to, especially if you're in DeFi, because if you get hacked, they are the first ones that you're going to call. But the hacker did get away with a total of $1 million. So let's get froggy. Now, the hack itself wasn't that interesting, to be honest. If we go to one of the contracts associated with their code base, we scroll down, we see it's a transparent upgradable proxy. Now, if you have a transparent upgradable proxy, you obviously have some type of proxy owner who can be the one to upgrade the proxy, change the proxy, etc. And if you want to transfer ownership, you just call the transfer ownership function. If we look at the transaction of this ownership transferred, we can see in here the logs, ownership transferred from this address to this address. We click on the previous owner. We can clearly see the previous owner who is now labeled as the Moby exploit person because, well, this private key was leaked. We can see that this was clearly an externally owned account. Now, as a lot of you know, because you went through Siphon Updraft, you know that you should never ever do this. If you're going to have a contract, if you're gonna have a code base that has some type of ownership property, it should always at least be on a multi-sig to protect exactly from attacks like this. If you are the single sole owner that owns the protocol and you get hacked, your private key gets stolen, boom, all your money gets sucked out, which is what we saw here. So the ownership was stolen from this externally owned account from this single private key to some new owner who is not labeled as the Moby exploiter, but probably should be. Once you take ownership of a transparent upgradable proxy, it's fairly trivial to upgrade it to whatever implementation you like and then steal all the funds. Luckily, the hackers made a mistake. They left some upgrade functionality open for anybody to come in and swoop in and just upgrade the contracts again. And that's what the SEAL 911 team did along with these wonderful volunteers. And they managed to save a lot of the money back. So just once again, huge thank you to the SEAL 911 team. Now here's where looking into the postmortem, I, I get a little more upset to be honest. So we scroll down to the postmortem and we see in the root cause analysis, we see something that I would argue isn't great. Now, just so everyone's on the same page, the purpose of a postmortem is to let your community know, you know, what went wrong and how you're going to fix it in the future but additionally let the rest of the cybersecurity community know what went wrong so that they can learn about what happened and they can go implement fixes. For example, the $50 million Radiant hack of last year was one of the most interesting hacks because it kind of exposed this issue of like, hey, uh, a lot of people don't actually know how to even verify multi-sig transactions. So we wanna say, okay, well, what can we learn from this so that we as an industry can be better? And this is where probably my main gripe with this postmortem is although they did a bunch of stuff really well too, and we'll go over that in a second. Uh, we have this, although internal security protocols for key management were in place, the attacker identified and exploited a vulnerability in the key management system. Okay, what what was that? What was what were you using? How did that happen? You know, there, there's a chance that maybe this is kind of just a bunch of BS and they're trying to just be like, hey, like, yeah, we had security and, and maybe they didn't. I digress, it's fine, whatever. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna move right past that, right? We learned nothing from this. This is them saying, yeah, yeah, yeah we were secure. You know, trust me. Next, they say the private key used for contract upgrades possess excessive privileges, which creates critical security weaknesses. Yes, great. So this is a postmortem for them. This is a takeaway for them. Hey, don't use a single EOA, you know, to control your smart contracts. The attacker gained control of this private key and maliciously altered smart key smart contracts leading to unauthorized drainage of funds. Yes. So this is the key piece here, right? Why did this happen? A, they used a, a single EOA for the owner of a DeFi protocol. You never want to do that. And then B, that private key got hacked, which is bad anyways. So the first one, okay, it's 2025. We really just shouldn't be doing that anymore. But B, this one is actually very interesting. Okay, how did they get control of the private key? And if you go through the rest of the postmortem, it does talk about the timeline, which was great. It talks about how they worked with SEAL 911, which was awesome. They don't mention anything about the private key. Here's where I have a big issue with this postmortem. That is like the interesting part of what happened here. The private key got hacked. How did that happen? What can I learn? What can we do to prevent ourselves from getting hacked? And I'm thinking, okay, either they don't know how they got hacked or they were embarrassed by how they got hacked, so they don't want to say it, which is tough. If that's the case, I'm sorry for uh, making this video, I guess. But so we go to the bottom and they talk about next steps. They talk about 
compensating the holders, which is great. We love to see that. They talk about continuing to track the stolen funds. That's fantastic. And this is what I'm actually interested in, the security enhancements, role separation, great. The deployment keys and the admin keys should be different and you should not use an EOA. Then they say key management, implementation of multi-layered security protocols for key management. I, just like, I wish that just said like, we're gonna use a safe multi-sig, but I digress. Organizational security, contract deployment procedures, blah, 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 sure. Basically, two things here. Number one, we're not gonna use a private key as the owner of our contracts anymore. And we're gonna make our private keys safer, even though in this post, we didn't say how we lost it in the first place. So, you know, I, I would have rather they said, hey, private key got leaked. We're not sure at this moment how that happened, right? To me, that would have been much more informational than private key got leaked. And now we're gonna ignore that for the rest of the post. So this hack happened about a week ago. I said, I wanna follow up with this. They recently said, hey, protocol's back open. So I said, great, let's follow up with this. Let's see what they actually implemented. Let's see if they did a good job. Now, uh, I only went through one of the contracts just to see what's up. And I have a whole bunch of notes in here on what I did. And this is how you too can kind of check up and make sure these protocols are doing good stuff, right? So we're, we really wanna check for just one thing. We wanna check that they're no longer using an externally owned account as the owner of this protocol, right? Because that was the big kind of security improvement. Hey, we're not gonna do that anymore. And then we're just gonna kind of hope and pray that the private keys that they use are like more secure now. So I got this address by going to the UI, trying to interact with the contracts, seeing what address they kicked me out to. This was one of the contracts that they kicked me out to. And if we go to this on Etherscan, we go to the contract, we can see this is a transparent upgradable proxy. Great, so we wanna see the logic of this contract. We can actually find that pretty easily by doing a cast call. So if we do cast storage here, we can actually see the storage of any smart contract at this storage location. Now this is going to be kind of the universal storage slot for most proxies. So we take that original proxy address, stick it in my little script here. I can now run this and we'll see that this is the location of the implementation. Obviously in bytes, I can copy it, stick this into Etherscan. And now I can see, okay, we have a contract here. This is the contract. This is the logic contract of that proxy. It's not verified, which isn't great. What's more important is we wanna get the admin address, which we can do by calling the, well, one of the more universal admin storage slots. We can also go through events and do that stuff. But basically if we call this cast function, then we run this in here, we can now see, okay, this is gonna be the proxy admin. This is gonna be who owns the proxy. We go to that address, boom. We see that this is indeed a proxy admin contract. If you're unfamiliar with these, definitely check these out on Open Zeppelin. These are very important contracts. And these also typically have an owner. So if we check again, we can kind of dig through the code, find the owner. Eventually you're gonna to come to this safe proxy contract. So this is the owner of the proxy admin. So I know there's kind of a lot of steps here. The proxy safe kicks into the proxy admin, which kicks to the transparent upgradable proxy, which kicks to the implementation. A lot of steps there. But so this safe proxy basically asks a multi-sig wallet, a safe multi-sig always what, hey, can I do this function? You know, can you guys sign off on this? And once again, if you go through the safe proxy, go through its storage, you find the storage slot, we are able to actually find the safe multi-sig in here. And this obviously is a proxy. So if you try to read it on Etherscan, it's not gonna work. So instead, I wrote a little test here in my Foundry project uh, to get the threshold, get the number of owners, right? And I'll even show you that forge test dash dash fork URL, arbitrum RPC URL dash VVV, or I think I just need two Vs. And we'll get this kicked out, threshold of five. You know, we can do this with kind of any function that we want. I did it kind of with this raw, you know, this raw static call. But I was also able to find all the different owners and we were able to find eight safe owners. So very happy to see that they add this safe multi-sig. This is a great way to keep this protocol more safe moving forward. Now, I'm not saying at all that this is an audit, that the code is safe to use. I'm just saying that it is great to see they said, hey, we're going to fix this issue about using a single private key EOA. And they actually did that. So the takeaway for you all watching this, number one, never, ever, 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 ever use a private key, a single EOA as the ownable for a contract that has anything of value in it. A, a much better solution is to use a safe multi-sig, which is what they ended up upgrading to. And then number two, if in a hack, your private key gets leaked and you don't know how it got leaked or you're embarrassed to say how it got leaked, 
don't just ignore it in the postmortem because for security researchers, that's like super freaking frustrating. And shameless plug, if you want to launch a protocol and be sure that you're not going to do something silly when you do it, be sure to check out the Cypher and Updraft DevOps curriculum for people who want to get into monitoring smart contracts, deploying smart contracts, and want to make sure they deploy them correctly. We've got a ton of curriculum on doing exactly this and working with this as well. So hope you learned something. Bye.